Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Monroe uh, Live podcast. This is the first. I've got Thomas Ingenlad here with me from uh, uh, CEO of um, CEO Volvo, or sorry, Polestar, kind of like Volvo, but different. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Polestar 2, which he drove today, and which we, it was in our list of uh, things to do, but also I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about the Polestar 3, which I'm even more excited about. And we'll probably, <laughs> we'll probably take one of those to pieces. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So shortly. So, um, so anyways, um, Thomas, uh, I, I, I'd like to start off maybe by finding out a little bit about you. Um, can you give us a little background on, uh, on, you know, your adventures, uh, to get to CEO, um, from, uh, wherever you started? Yeah, wherever I started, it's uh, the Volkswagen Group. I've been for 20 years in the Volkswagen Group uh -huh. and various positions, always as a designer. I I'm, I'm, was educated as a car designer and worked, for example, as head of Skoda Design for, for quite some years in Prague. Mm. And then after 20 years, um, there was a call from Sweden to um, help Volvo to develop their new lineup for when, Vo when Volvo really basically um, was kicked out of the Ford group, found their, their own, um, their own uh, destiny, of course, supported and, and, and yeah. uh, having Geely there in the background. So we yeah. designed the XC90, which is on the road today. Yes. Um, and really kicked off the repositioning of Volvo as a, as a premium um, car again. Super mm. strong brand here in the US, still very much alive yeah. at that point in time. Yeah. And it worked beautifully. So that car line really helped Volvo to come back. And after that generation done, um, electrification obviously was a big, big topic at that point in time. The idea of going electric was very relevant for, for mm. Volvo, of course, anyway. I mean, that was clear. Yeah. They, they yeah. will do that. But do a car brand that is fully concentrated on the, on the electrification have a different proposition in the premium segment that Volvo does, because let's face it, Volvo is very much defined of what it caters for. So mm -hmm. that's where the idea of Polestar came up. So we created that new electric car brand. Nobody in Europe dared to think that way, despite the fact that here in the US and of course in Asia, there were a lot of new things happening. Yeah. So it was only that spirit of, yeah, Swedish, open-mindedness yeah. and Chinese entrepreneurship yeah. that uh, made this European startup happening. Hmm. I had, of course, lots to do with creating the products for this brand, the idea of what that brand would look and feel like, what it would stand for. And when it came to execution, um, I was asked to um, consider if, if I would not get out of my designer comfort zone and do a new, new thing there. That's how six years ago I started running the brand Polestar. Cool. So just out of curiosity, how long did it take to go from zero to your first EV onto the road? The first Polestar. Uh, 2016, the whole Polestar brand started. 17, it was clear that the Polestar 2 would be our first battery electric car on the road. Mm -hmm. Remember there was this... Right, hybrid GT before yeah, the Polestar one, that. yeah, and the launch in yeah, we showed the car the first time 2020, just started delivering in 21. Mm. So mm. it was because it was using certain CMA that was a platform for the XC40. Right. Um, having said that, of course, it was a heavy operation to 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 redesign it for a better electric purpose. So that was um, including the integration of the gas system, the Google Android system, which of right. course was the second big thing yeah. about the Pulsar 2, bringing that for yeah. the first time to yeah. customers. So these two things were are quite an adventurous journey, but I have to say it turned out like a very successful first step for the brand. 
So I'm just trying to do the math. So that means that you probably cranked it out in uh, um, about 48, 50 months um, from concept to having the Polestar 2 out? Yeah. That'd be about right. Production line obviously yeah. kind of was up and running, so you had to do the yeah. additional, the, the first step where you do the battery floor. Right. But indeed the production in in reality, when it's it's amazing to see there is a battery electric um, Pulsar 2 or XC40 on the line, and the next car behind it is the, still the combustion engine or yeah. hybrid. Um, yeah. So that is kind of after the first um, base is done, they join the factory. So that's why, of course, um, time-wise, this was quite efficient. Yeah, yeah. So um, Ford actually, with the Lightning, uh, we're told uh, that was a two-year project, and mainly because they had a frame and they could put anything they want underneath it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it made things uh, quite simple, well, much simpler for them to, to try and crank it out. Normally with a unibody or monocoque, uh, Europeans are wondering that uh, that that usually is not the case. Usually, you've got a significant amount of. So you must have had deep rockers on the uh, on the original design, so that you could get the battery pack in. Or well, I have to say the engineers made an amazing job to design that battery pack. Yeah. Sp and initially, seventy-eight kilowatt hours battery, so not so small for for such a car. That's a that's relative. That's bigger if, than that's bigger than a model uh, a model three. If if you see how they, because it's not a flat floor battery, it actually yeah. uses because of course the car had a yeah, tunnel, right. yeah, so yeah. it uses a tunnel. It uses um, the at the rear floor that the mm -hmm. two putting two um, stacks of batteries on top. It's 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 real. It's quite a complicated puzzle because yes, it had to fit into kind of an existing car structure, but it, Turned out highly efficient. It's amazing if you have certain parameter which are fixed, engineers can actually be very creative right. to just yeah. work with the parameters and to do something within there. Quite yeah. amazing. Yeah. But of course, very different to the Polestar 3 story, which has been then that's the bespoke. first bespoke yeah. electric platform. Yeah, yeah. that's the what. Actually, uh, the reason that the the reason that we went with the Mustang instead of the Polestar 2 was because the Mustang was, for the most part, a brand new bespoke. Yeah. And I wanted to see what that would look like. So we had to flip a coin, and that's the way it went. Mm -hmm. However, I'm very interested in what's going to happen with the Polestar 3. Now, I got a chance to see one um, at CES. I was really impressed. The interior, um, I think, is to die for. I, I really did like, I, I liked the way it looked little stiff on the price. I think it's like 90000 or something like that is the projected price for that vehicle in North America. In the first year when you get yeah. the all-wheel drive, including the Plus and the Pilot package, yeah. the price range will go a little lower when we have the rear-wheel driven and then decoupled from the packages. Wow. So the entry ticket will go all somewhere to seventy five. Seventy five. So I, I, think that, um, I think that bringing the the more expensive vehicle to the market first is always a good idea because it helps um, it helps your investment costs go in a, in a good and right di direction. But um, and for me or for Monroe anyway, Monroe and Associates, we would probably want the most the highest end we could get um, because I want to see what kind of excitement you guys have popped into that vehicle. And I am I'm more interested in in uh, cars that are bespoke, brand new mm -hmm. designs, uh, because that that really determines um, the depth that a company's got in as far as uh, as far as um, how they can they can design a car. So I'm very very much interested in the in the uh, in the three. I, I think it's going to be a, a good seller. Um, I'm very interested in um, in a lot of things. Actually, one thing that I um, I saw there was, it was 111 kilowatt hours on the vehicle that was at uh, CES. It, but then I read something else where it, it's higher, a much higher number. It's still the same? No, it's 111 kilowatt hour battery, which yeah. is a long range battery in this yeah. car. Yeah. And of course, it's a, uh, it's, it's a fairly big SUV. It's on the platform that um, will carry as well the 
what's called the EQ, EX90, the, the electric replacement of the XC90. So for that type of um, size, um, mm. you need, of course, a decent range and the 111 kilowatt hour deliver set. That's excellent. What what about whose whose batteries are you using? Like um, we are having supply from CATL and LG Chem. Catel, yeah, mm. and LG Chem. So you're we're going to produce a car here in the US as well. So we will for the US and for Europe actually produce in South Carolina in the plant which so far does the S60 Volvo mm -hmm. that is at the moment being remodeled the workshop for the electric platform. And there is the production as well for export to Europe uh, happening. And this, of course, is then as well LG, LG Chem battery supply. Mm. Well, I, I know that uh, there's um, some big announcement that uh, the government in the U.S. is supposed to make regarding the um, content and who you can buy materials from and everything else. Um, and I don't see how, um, I really don't see how anybody's going to be able to move fast enough here in the U.S. to complete a mining and refining in any anything short of five years. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. So it's probably still going to be something that's going to have something to do with the importation of either raw materials or battery packs from different, uh, different uh, uh, companies in China. I agree with you a little bit. This connection there sometimes with how yeah. the question is for us to do this or that, yeah. which we're all happy to do. It just takes a bit more time, right? Than, um, and more cost, <laughs> and, and because it, it will cost. be more expensive here. Than, yeah. than, but you also mentioned Geely, and that's kind of interesting too, because Geely was one of our customers. We don't do business in China anymore, um, simply because we've got a, a DOD mm. contract and that precludes it. But um, um, but Geely was very anxious to uh, get data on teardowns and all the uh, all the training and whatnot. It was amazing how many how many engineers they had um, soaking up the method that we use for new product development. Um, how much of that transferred over to your operation in in Sweden? Well, the. Uh, it's a it's a it's a group where certain joint projects are happening. Certain things are um, very decoupled. It's um, very dependent on what kind of nature the project is. For example, the Spa Two platform where the Polestar Three is built on is very much um, a Volvo slash Polestar project. So mm -hmm. we are using this platform, but especially when you go to um, the more lower price points in the premium segment, of course, there we are meeting more the technical demands that exist within the Geely group for their more advanced projects. So there we meet and do certain things together. Like, for example, um, um, a, a car like, like the Polestar to the CMA, there's a Lincoln Co. product. Yeah, that's which, the one I was kind of uh, hoping we could get into. because yeah. I, So sometimes there is this um, yeah. overlap where indeed uh, a good cooperation is happening. Mm. Lincoln Co., um, I, I got a chance to have a look at some of the styles and stuff like that in your new <laughs> and extremely beautiful um, um, design center. I, I was totally blown away when we went through that, and uh, I, I just I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The, uh, the architecture alone is, is worth the trip, uh, but then looking at all of the capabilities you've got inside that uh, that that area is just stunning i i do not know anyone who has anything that looks looks anywhere near the uh i don't know what the right word would be but but the it's so exotic the design so well center done. in Gothenburg. yeah yeah absolutely i i've never seen anything quite like it can you elaborate a little on that because we were there, it wasn't open at the time. They were finishing things mm. up and whatnot. But even then, the uh, the milling machines for machining, machining uh, foam and things like that, everything was there but not operational yet. You know? No, it's a very um, good point you're making. It just simply shows how much they actually believe that that 
part of the creation, the, the design job is actually yeah. important for, for the product. And like you saw it there in Gothenburg, of course, um, the development is happening all over the world for, for the group. Right, yeah. And the big, big um, hub is Gothenburg, where Volvo, Polestar, Link & Co. Uh, have, have very substantial R&D and design work. And let's face it, Scandinavian design is a very popular, very across the world accepted right. design direction. So, of course, for that reason, there, there is, a, is a great creativity and potential yeah. there. The design center is beautiful. It's built um, from scratch. So, really, the dream of um, anybody getting something like that together. Yeah. And it radiates. I mean, if you give um, these people that kind of... Sh cherish their 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 work with such yeah. a beautiful working environment of course it should spurn their their eagerness oh well, it's hard to uh, hard to design something beautiful if you're stuck in a cave yeah. i mean cave drawings versus uh you know something like the sistine chapel totally different <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i I, th I believe that uh, i believe that if you surround people in a in a in a good environment they're going to come up with much much better product than if you, mm. like I say, put them in a cave. So I was very, very impressed. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So we've, we've talked a little bit about um, some of the attributes that, and, and we actually did a small video, which maybe we can cut some parts into, into this video. Um, but we, we, we did a video when we were at the, um, at the show in, uh, in Las Vegas, the, uh, the electronic show. Um, are you are you going to be like? Where's the next place that we're going to be able to see the um, the the new uh, Pulsar three? The Pulsar three will. We had an event just um, the other day here in New York, presenting the car to the public, and it's traveling to LA. It will from LA go to several spaces along the West Coast, and then return here to the East Coast. So I'm. Mm. Um, we could give you um, a hint of when it, when it pops up here. It has as well the next big milestone is of course that we will have the first cars in the showrooms in the poster spaces around August this year. That's what I was kind of looking forward yeah. to. Yeah. So in August. So is there pre-orders? Like, is this something you're going to have to wait a year for uh, in order to get one? Or well, what's the production rate? I I, I read that. Yeah, you did about fifty thousand last year for Posta Two, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and then this year, what are you shooting for? Eighty thousand. Eighty thousand. That will be Posta Two no, and it's Posta Two. There's a tiny portion of Posta Three incorporated, uh -huh. yeah. but the full year twenty four will be the, the the main year where Posta Three really kicks in. So Posta Three in twenty four will be um, a made a major step up for for volume for us. Yeah. So now this one is bespoke. Um, can you run both those down the same assembly line? The two and the four? No, or that's, the that's the not the idea because the technology is very different. Yeah. And the uh, yeah. Hosta 3 is then in, um, in a different factory, as I said, here in South Carolina. Oh, that's right. Um, that's right. This is being built in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. and that is where um, this, it's, it's called the SPA 2 technology. Um, Really, the initial idea was, of course, to use have some synergy with SPA-1. Having said that, as it, of course, ends up always, um, basically the whole, whole technology is re-engineered. It's right. uh, from a physical point of view, um, of course, designed around the, the electric drivetrain. And we have as well a new electronic core system in there. And um, with NVIDIA, powered um, computing so basically very much from scratch new mm. so how much do you think percentage wise is carryover from uh, the Polestar 2 percentage wise uh, Polestar 2 I'm tempted to say zero now um. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's actually probably good to hear so that means that I, I didn't waste money in buying <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's just uh, internal uh, internal economics here. So I'm I'm glad we didn't buy a, a Polestar two. The Polestar three, I think um, I think is going to be extremely exciting. You know, you were mentioning uh, Swedish design and whatnot. Um, we we were just working with uh, or 
looking at uh, Winnebago's new product, a new electric entry. And, um, and uh, they have something that they call, it's a combination of Japanese and, uh, and Swedish. Mm. And they've made a new name up, and I've forgotten what it is. But anyways, um, but they, they say these are the, the two most recognizable and most um, appreciated uh, styles um, in North America. So by combining the two, and, and I will tell you the, the, the Winnebago, this little teeny Winnebago uh, thing, it really, it really is spectacular compared to the old one that they showed us. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Swedish, uh, Swedish design. I grew up when they first started bringing, you know, Swedish furniture over and whatnot. Everybody went like nuts for it and everybody mm-hmm. dumped what used to be called um, mid-century modern, and everybody went to the, the Swedish uh, Swedish look. Yeah. That's a great um, design. You know, I'm growing up in, in Germany with Bauhaus, a very functionalist yeah. uh, design direction. And I think what Swedish design does, it gives that a bit more human, warmer touch to that yeah. functionalism. And that combination just works very well. Yeah, well, it's functional, but, you know, it's really comfortable as well and usable. Mm-hmm. That's what everybody kind of looked at, the clean lines and stuff like that. And that's what I saw when I was looking at the, uh, when I was looking at the Polestar 3 yeah. clean lines. Uh, I mentioned another car that I'd driven a couple of weekends ago. Too busy, too many buttons, too much. I mean, how do you, how do you, at, uh, how do you guys at Volvo or, or Polestar, how do you get around that? What, what do you do that, uh, that, forces people into one direction uh, because that's really that cultural thing is what people are really looking for not just uh not just car people and whatnot but but also um folks in other industries or even just the average buyer what what drives the the volvo design approach so that you can you can make the right decisions for the customer uh two things the bun is if you have the original idea and design that all the work from then is to maintain it as much as possible and don't get screwed away by, okay, that doesn't work, then we have to change. No, really try all the time to make that original concept and idea, bring it into production. And that is whenever we show the first concept, people were amazed how Mm. it went through. When I look at the design sketch from the poster three years ago from our designer action american one naum um it it is still very very much preserved the first design model and the production sheet model car now you could not tell the difference if you stand next to it the other wow. thing is in each we spend time discussing how to not add things how can we avoid to having to do this or that extra because mm, it doesn't work not quite how we want it. Spent hours of trying to, 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 to not having to add unnecessary yeah. stuff. And of course, not being afraid of that, that things might not be, you know, decorated enough. I'm very much, even the first XC90, that was the first reaction. Oh, I said now not too, too naked or whatever. Yeah. And now yeah. to be really proud and, and, and confident and what you created there does not need dressing up. It is the, the pure yeah. pureness. And that's what is within our you know, pure progressive performance. Pure means really staying pure to your, right. your idea and your ideals. And we call it a laser beam focus. And quite frankly, that's where almost every car company that we've tried to work with was startups. They always fail the same way. Always. They can't keep the focus they don't want to stay pure they want to do this vehicle oh and unless now they they're all excited like kids in a can bo- uh, in a candy store and then oh let's have a, like a pickup truck or let's make um you know a unicycle you, you can only have one focus and when i talk to investors um about different startup companies and whatnot um that's one of the things that i bring forward if you want to be successful, you have to have a laser beam focus. Here is the style. It's not going to change. 
Here are the attributes they are not going to change. Here's the, the look that's come up with, like I said, Monroe and Associates works below the skin. When we do new product development, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, Sunberg Ferrar is one of our partners, and we let them do the artwork, and then we'll do everything underneath the artwork. When we do a new product, that's, that's the way we want. And sometimes a customer mm. will come with the artwork, and then we'll work from there. But at the, at the outset, you look at what they have, and if it's clean and it's, as you say, pure, why, why are we adding three more buttons that do the exact same thing? I mean, all that does is confuse the, confuse the driver, confuse, confuse the, that's how airplanes fail, is when pilots mm. are overwhelmed by the data. And in fact, that's why if you look at an airplane cockpit now, you used to have, you know, 30 steam gauges, we used to call them. Now they got one box, tells them everything they need to know. They don't. And somehow we still see people wanting to add more buttons, putting things on a steering wheel. But I, and I, I, I often wonder, um, why, how does this happen? How does that creep? Um, we call it scope creep. How does scope creep happen? How does it, how does it get in and how did you keep it out? Um, because like what I saw, it looked very clean and pure. Well, it's, it's, it's about the decision making. And if you innovate with new technology, then you have to review how it has been done in the past and embrace how you can do it now in the future. Mm. And that takes, you know, guts to actually decide, okay, now yeah. that we can do it that way, we do it that way. And you don't build in that safety net. Yeah, we do it like that, but we still keep how we did it before as well. And then maybe, oh, but we can do it as well in the steering wheel. Let's put it there as yeah. well. And you end up with, you know, triple redundant uh, ways of right. functioning. That it's sometimes a very undemocratic process because somebody has to make that decision and say, yeah. okay, guys, fair enough. There are two, three opinions how that could be, but somebody has to make up their mind and say, we do it that way instead of implementing all three ways of doing it. Well, that's one of the things that I, I, you know, I don't want to bring up Tesla too often, but that's one of the things I really yeah. admire about Tesla is they made a decision, they stuck to it, and they never changed. And as far as buttons and whatnot are concerned, it's got the least number of buttons of anything on any car. But when you force people into doing things differently, sometimes you wind up with folks who are, mm, let's say, not as progressive what, what, what do you do at Volvo or at uh, Polestar for, uh, for that kind of a scenario? Um, like we're, we're seeing right now where companies, major companies, are making gigantic splits. Uh, these are going to be the EV guys. These are going to be the ICE guys. These are going to be sustaining engineering group or something like that. Um, that seems to be the magic number is three for most of the bigger companies. And in fact, in the case of your alma mater there, Volkswagen, Volkswagen has actually uh, chopped uh, North America off and said, oh, you guys design your own cars. And, um, and I don't exactly understand what's going on with, um, with everybody, but I'm kind of curious to know how you guys have, um, how you folks have, uh, have, you know, made the separation between ICE vehicles, EVs, hybrids, whatever. That's the biggest task for the big OEMs at the moment, how to how to manage that transformation. Yeah. And I think the clearer and the most dedicated you draw that line and say here the double development stops and we just simply concentrate on the new thing, the the easier you and, and the most efficient and, and successful you can do it. Polestar was created as a company that fully concentrates on that battery technology. Volvo made that very clear decision on, okay, from that moment on, we don't develop ice trains anymore. That's where you still then have the task of, you know, getting people's heads around, oh, what has been the, the the rules and the habits before they still have to adapt to the new one. But at least they don't have to 
dance yeah, between yeah, two between different two. mindsets. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of this discussion about, oh, yeah, but we should be, you know, technology open and, and not make now that, that firm decision. At some point, you have to, for, for, for good reasons, right. concentrate on something. Because if you always have two things in your mind, you get, you get crazy nuts. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean that you're not technology open. It just means that you give a clear direction of what is now the path for the next 10 years. Mm. Well, most of the people that I've talked to find, okay, so I was an ancient engineer. That was my job at, uh, at Ford uh, when I was working there and um, until I went to finance staff. I don't know how that happened. But anyway, um, but at, at the end of the day, um, very little of what I learned as, a, as a, an ancient engineer is transferable to electric drive systems. You know, um, a transmission is really complicated, lots of bits and pieces. Um, the gearbox that you have in, uh, in an electric car is very, very, very simple. So how, how, how um, like, what do you do with some of the folks that, where their knowledge is, is not relevant anymore? Uh, how are you working with that? Do you do retraining or is it, you know, so long, have, have a nice day or what, what, do, what, are you, what are you guys doing? I mean, the great thing about human mankind is the capability of actually switching and learning. Yes. I mean, curiosity and just using, I mean, the brain is still valid. I mean, yeah. the brain that you use to do and the creativity, certain ways of innovation uh, thinking. So just simply dedicate your life now to the new thing mm. it was um and funnily enough that is what actually keeps people on their toes and yeah maybe even gets them out of a rather dull place after having done for 20 years the same thing to actually get onto the new stuff that's amazing it takes a little while but surprisingly a much shorter time that you would expect that they get fully fire onto the new mm. thing um, no, that I think is absolutely possible. It's just really, like like I said before, it needs that very clear direction. Say, look, this is what we concentrate now on. Yeah. Well, the the biggest thing for me is I'm looking at there's much less in the way of complication from a mechanical standpoint, and a tremendous amount of extra complications when you start looking at. Um, uh, the electronics yeah. and whatnot. That was where, where I would have been gone now because that yeah. indeed is a new thing. Funnily enough, even the even the ice train cars, electronic wise, right. got already into it, such a Hercules task. But now that is really the the, the the field where car industry definitely has has to transform into something much mm. more software oriented. Mm. That's um, certainly where. When, you, when we talked about before about electric engines and stuff, in a way that's still, despite the fact that it's a new field, it's still a technology which is somehow in the scope of what automotive engineers are kind of used to do. But software and really software engineering and that thinking, that of course is a complete different world. Yeah, well, that's... Um uh, we found out, <coughs> or actually some of our customers have found out the hard way that um, not every software engineer is adaptable to the type of software that, that a car uh, or an airplane is uh, is capable of, uh, mm. of, of needing. Uh, not capable, but absolutely needs. So um, so there's, there's a big sieve of... Uh, Sifting, trying to get the, the right people to do the right things. It's it's uh, it's a transitional area that I think um, is going to be painful for some, and uh, for others, I think they're just going to dive in and 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 they'll have no problems with it. But what do you see as the future? Like we haven't we've talked about uh, when we walked around. I said that um, uh, you know Tesla has gone from wound electric motors now to hairpin motors. Excellent idea, but then we started tearing apart the uh, the Lucid um, electric motor, and the Lucid gearbox is like nothing I've ever seen ever for the type of power and whatever. This is just like 
mind blowing uh, the, the the difference. Mm-hmm. What do you think is beyond that? Where do you think we're going to be going in the uh, in the distant future? Not just next week or next month, but maybe by the time we get to twenty thirty. Where do you think we're going to be looking at as far as the percentage of electric vehicles? Um, what new what new techniques are sitting out there? Where do you where do you see the future going? Well, certain certain elements um, will be very much dictated by maturing this new technology. Getting rid of the permanent magnets in the electric engines definitely is a big big task ahead, but doable, very beneficial. Um, and then clearly, Sandy, the big mega challenge will be the each and every engineering point taking into consideration reducing CO2 footprint, getting the burden that there is with CO2 in any produced piece out of the car. Mm. We were having a walk and we looked at, you know, showed me the electric battery tray. My immediate question would have been, okay, you might have advantages towards the aluminum case, but the aluminum case, I know I can recycle 100%, no problem to have that in a cycular process. How about this plastic? That is where we do a lot, a lot of research and work a lot with, um, of course, partners, suppliers, companies that yeah. are on that journey. It is um, one of the biggest engineering tasks for the next 10 years, how to get the CO2 footprint out of our products. Yeah, and you've done a fine job. I heard that, um, I read that that uh, that your green footprint or your footprint is getting a lot greener than everybody else because you've looked at the beginning of the program or at the beginning of the cycle, which ones of these materials or these processes yeah. um, give us the best results with the lowest carbon footprint, not on the vehicle itself, but the emissions that come out of the tailpipe or anything, but how much in the way of emissions, and I I can't remember how many tons it was that you uh, you reduced. It's um, what we call the the life cycle assessment, a a yearly checkup, where are we with any car in our production? The Posta 2, of course, was the first one where we had a full report, and it was 27 tons the first year. Mm. That is more than a combustion engine car, yes. But the analysis shows as well, if you then have a use case of, I don't know, 15,000 kilometer per year, after two and a half years, you're actually in the in a in better the position yeah. than the ice train car. And of course, we want to reduce that burden as cl- close as possible to, to zero, which is, of course, super difficult. And some of the steps are actually easy. You just simply, where you produce today with, call it now, fossil energy, if you go and have natural water power, hydrogen power, whatever, to, to produce your batteries, boom, 24% less CO2 burden of the mm. POSA 3 battery compared to the POSA 2 battery, just by changing that, the energy source. For right. Many other things become more cumbersome and difficult. But sometimes it's just asking the right question. We very often come to our partners and s- just asking, hey, how much could we actually in that new piece enhance the amount of recycled plastic before it gets difficult in its attributes? Mm-hmm. Sometimes you get, oh, you're the first one who's asking that. And I cannot believe it that that still is not almost a standard in in what you go out as an RFQ to, to, to suppliers that you, of course, ask for... Um, that element. So there are some low-hanging fruits that can already do a big, big benefit. And mm. we would already benefit if the industry would align on a standard of measuring, which still doesn't exist, Yeah. so that you have a very clear definition of how we all would report on the, on the CO2 footprint of your product. Mm. Well, that <coughs> that is tough because... You're you're now talking about governments, and I've never heard of any governments that ever aligned with anything. In fact, even departments in the same government can't seem to get their um, 
That's one of the big uh, frustrating things, as well a big cost driver. If you see how um, all the legislation and rules are so scattered around the world, it's yeah. a disaster. I can't even imagine what homolog homologation is going to look like in the not-so-distant future. And other people that I've talked to, they're, they're scared to death that um, some fool who... And actually, many of the people that I've talked to in these different agencies and whatnot have really no clue. They have, they've never worked in a car plant. They've never designed mm -hmm. anything in their life. They don't, they don't, uh, they have an uncle who happens to be a congressman or something. I don't know how this all happens, but, but it certainly doesn't come from industry. It used to, but it doesn't anymore. Um, but one of the things that I was wondering about um, that I've been pushing for actually since I've been, at, uh, since I was at Ford is uh, going from um, 12 volt to 48 volt and Tesla's made that announcement, that will definitely reduce the weight, which is the main factor when you're looking at range. Um, it it also should, um, should um, reduce the amount of complexity because if everything is at 48 or, or, or 240, I mean, things go a lot easier. Everything, everything seems to work out a, a whole lot better if we can do that. Have, have you guys looked at that at all? Going to forty-eight volts, yeah, and it's it, it, the benefits of it, of course, are on the end. It's just that if you're stuck in one in one um, system, and for years all the all the industry is has developed components in it to switch it. Now it, it's just sometimes it needs just that initiative, and boom, then it happens. So yeah. maybe that will be the tipping point where indeed it will now happen that we switch all to 48. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you that um, in talking to suppliers, uh, it's funny, but they said, oh, yeah, we've had 48 volt. We, we've got them here, but nobody wants to buy them. Oh. And they kind of like, so it's kind of like uh, OEMs point this way and, um, <laughs> and tier twos point in the other direction. I'm just wondering how much capability there might be out there because Tesla has announced that they're probably going to make most of their sensors and um, and some of their connectors internally. Uh, they're just going to do it themselves. They're about as vertically integrated as you can get, um, apart from Henry Ford growing his own rubber trees and things. But uh, but apart from that, where do you think uh, where do you think Volvo is going to be as far as vertical integration is concerned? That's a little bit the question of. What you're aiming at and tesla is of course on the journey where they're gonna you know aim for 10 million cars per year competing with volkswagen toyota of course that's a complete different mm. mindset where vertical integration uh, has a different purpose and meaning mm. than if you're a, a car maker who is in a premium luxury segment limited in terms of how much you actually want to produce it really has to be a, a very clever game um, making sure that you that the exclusivity kind of maintains and there I think you have to accept and acknowledge that you have to work very wisely with certain things that you do yourself because it matters for your brand and there is a big gain and on other things you just simply have to work together with partners for example in the case of Polestar we very clearly would never ever go and develop our own safety system, our own um, autopiloting system. This is where yeah. we, of course, harvest what is the, the big, big knowledge within the Volvo uh, company and get safety, ADA systems, autopiloting, the LiDAR that we introduced now in the Poster 3. Um, all of this is, of course, based on software and, and, and knowledge that is in right. the Volvo group. That's... Um, Scales, of course, to a bigger thing. Would we go into battery production ourselves? No, most certainly not. Of course, this is where we would um, very much work together with yeah, a company like Northworld, which is now happening in, in the north of Europe, um, yeah. very close to us. That's, of course, where you search for the partners that you do it together with. So it's a slight different approach, I have to admit. Well, some of the things I know uh, we were talking about, um, the seats we're in um, are... Yeah basically seats out of a Tesla, and now <laughs> um, uh, your seats are, um, you're, you're, you're making your own, correct? You still, you're, you're, you have yeah, your own cushions. That's, 
It's so relevant for you know what the customer feels and thinks yeah. about. The yeah. seats are so important, and indeed, there's a very, very good heritage, very good knowledge. The engineer who has been doing these seats um, for Tesla to that nice quality, indeed, is a gentleman who I met before he left Volvo to then help Tesla to get yeah. better seats, um, who is But now back home in Sweden, and uh, oh. we work together again. No, it's uh, of course something where certain certain attributes of the cars are um, just outstanding within the company because there is this, and some things comes natural. I mean that's funny, but I have recognized working in different cultures. It's very clearly that you know the seats being that comfy and great. Yeah, it's not because you know some kind of marketing fancy idea came. Oh, that would be great to have. It's a very natural almost national quality that this type of coziness, comfortness, yeah. that type of relaxed driving that it gives you is natural to 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 Sweden and to people working now, that's of course, for, for Volvo. Mm -hmm. That's where we saw all of that gives it such a clear um, attribute to do something which is a bit more sporty, a bit more driver-oriented was exactly where there was a blank spot which Volvo would and should never do, which then suited the new brand Polestar. Mm. So that's where we have, of course, um, a slight different angle and or orientation in the product attributes. So what other uh, major, because many uh, companies have uh, outsourced everything, uh, steering wheels, instrument panels, seats, um, Pretty much anything that uh, that mm -hmm. customer it used to be, if a customer touched it, that was profound knowledge, and we didn't want to we didn't want to give that away when I was first at Ford. Later on, it was um, you know the fashion changed a bit and give everything away, and uh, uh, I'm it just comes wondering, and goes in cycles. Yeah, it does. But wh where are you uh, with Polestar? What what uh, what are the major? I know I we already talked about the seats. What else? Uh, Have you uh, decided to keep in house? Well, the company is definitely um, standing on these three pillars: design, sustainability, and innovation. And when we talk about design, that's clearly that that core that brings it all together. Um, we have a very strong focus on making the say sustainability, as we talked about, not just producing an electric car, bringing CO two down. So we do a lot of work around. CO2 reduction in our materials. This is where we we don't do that, of course, on our own, but this is where we add a lot, help young companies, young ideas to actually get into production. Mm. And that is a hard, hard bit, which they mostly fail in. So for us to come and really bring then the process in, the knowledge of how you can take that great new idea and make a producible and, and high frequency producible piece out of it. That is where we do a lot of um, our, our 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 put energy and money into into that. An example is um, a natural fiber B comp material that we use in the Polestar 3, for example, for the for the back uh, cladding of the seat, which is made yeah, out yeah. of this um, natural grown fiber which really has very similar attributes as, as a, um, a carbon fiber. Oh, so Kniff or something like that? Kniff is like a... Like a the company is called like B-Comp. It's, it's located in Switzerland. They have um, flux. What is the English word for flux? I always forget that. Flax is flax. It, okay, that is, is flax. Word. It's, so it's flax. Yeah. Mm. And they have... Um, that it's, 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 it brings weight... Um, advantage, of course, it's much lighter, um, and being a natural grown material, of course, it has no CO2 burden that ah. it brings into the car. So that's um, one of the um, focus where, where Polestar is concentrating on. And then, of course, we do um, a lot of what what runs the car as a software, the, 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 the work with the software, not that we invent our new core OS, that of course um, yeah. is something that comes with the platform into the company, but then working with it, doing the battery management, how you 
do the attributes of the car, how it responds to everything. There, there are a lot of uh, competences, of course, centered around um, software of it. So would we um, go and and do very very much our own battery? Um, um, yes, we we have certain corners where we say, okay, this is where where our battery. For example, in the Poster 5, this GT, which is coming, where we had much more in our, our own design in it. But for example, the Poster 3, of course, the battery, um, as it is designed, comes from the platform as it is developed mm -hmm. for this part too. So that's where we um, pick and choose. It very much depends on the, um, the degree of how much this product is a platform that we use. Or is it something which is a bit more specific to our company, like the Polestar 5 and 6? Mm. <clears throat> there will be a Polestar 4, 5, and 6. And quite frankly, that would bring you from where we are now into 2030. Uh, based on three, you know, a car out every three years. Uh, that's a very aggressive, uh, that would be a very aggressive. It's uh, quite thing. aggressive, but it's actually. Um, but I think doable. Well, it is. It is even a bit more aggressive because we have in two what we needed to do as a young company going into that electrification, we needed to really give that offer of four cars line up till twenty five before basically that space is totally filled and gone. Mm. So we have the poster three and the four as a couple of SUVs. And the poster four will come already now with with the uh, um, Shanghai Motor Show we presented, yeah. and there are two products which uh, they are a couple that fits very well together. The poster three is the more expensive car, starting then at seventy five thousand, and the poster four is positioned from sixty to eighty thousand. So they kind of um, add to each other yeah. in terms of how they cover the span, and you know we. We, we do certain inventions which make may might not sound as profound as I don't know mega casting whatever, but I think they are very meaningful in terms of how you apply modern technology to rethink of something which has been like a given. Yeah. And the poster four will introduce something. I think you will like that. There is a you know that for decades the car industry struggles with. The fact that what you need to project as a beam to the back for the inner mirror yeah. is, of course, very much contradicting what you want to do with the roof there. Yeah, bringing bringing the the, the beam that there is out of the space where where the yeah. head of the passenger yeah, yeah, is. Yeah. So naturally, that always is moving there where the where the the ray of the of the eyesight goes. Right. Yeah. That we solve. By just simply replacing an, the the physical beam with a camera at the roof right. of the car yeah. and have a have the screen there, yeah. and by that, I mean, and then using that to really move then the beam, which is normally in the way, moving it that far back right. that you can really relax the head, have a nice headroom, and we just took the rear glass out there is no rear glass in that car the glass roof goes quite far and then just simply the the sheet metal of the boot goes all the way to the roof yeah and there's no in between glass section and, and that it creates instead of then you realize suddenly when you look into your mirror that the big mirror that you have that there's only this teeny tiny real yeah. view right normally and then suddenly boom you have a real nice big view even in the dark you see much more than just the two headlights yeah. in the rear you see it much more the corners of the street and stuff it's i think a very very nice application well i'll tell you what um you've made my day because quite frankly i have a real problem with rear view mirrors and i've been um <clears throat> i've been uh, challenging the government here in the united states to change their mind on cameras versus rear view mirrors for a long mm. time and um so Eric is uh, giving me the evil eye, which means that we're probably ready to go. But I am super glad that we managed to get <laughs> something that makes me extremely happy. Uh, a, a little view into the, the Polestar 4 is going to have this. So I'm very, very happy that you, you kind of threw that in right at the end 
just to make it so that when we wrap up here, um, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll be smiles, all smiles. So, Thomas, thank you so much. Uh, and this is our inaugural, this is our very first deal. So thank you so much for being our first guest here on thank you so much uh, for Monroe Live Podcast. Very thank you. Let's enjoy it. And thank you uh, for viewing uh, us here at uh, at uh, Monroe Pulse. I'm sorry, pull start. <laughs> I can't get over it. So uh, uh, thank you for viewing us here on uh, Monroe Live uh, uh, podcast. And this is our first one. If you like it, um, uh, let Eric be happy and you can send him a note. Thanks so much. Thank you.